the algorithm in use for the algorithm that I use for this is called market thrust times the advancing volume minus the declining issues times the declining volume. It's a relatively simple arithmetic, and that gives you what everybody is an average that's applied in TradeStation. If you have TradeStation, you have this code, you can find it as market thrust. It's an indicator. You can put it on charts yourself. Things that are slightly different in it. This is the same, and these numbers tend to be in the hundreds of thousands, and pretty much what I care about are the first three digits of that. And so I'd rather have an extra half inch of glass, and so I simply cut the size of the number down. I do believe that I use something around 100,000 over here. Trust outside of regular market hours doesn't mean anything. But trade station and arithmetic being what it is, sometimes you get numbers between those times. And so I blot out from wherever it is that I have a start zero time and an end zero time. I just see a whole moving average that calculates this number up here. Then there's a long one that I use because I was interested in crossovers once upon a time. Uh, turns out that didn't work too well for me, but you'll see it on some of the charts. And then there's an oscillator, the difference between average for the market thrust. And what happens there is that you can see how different these numbers are. And I'll show you that on a chart. Just use the slope change stuff so much. I wrote the function so that I didn't have to do that greater than, less than, blah, blah, blah stuff repeatedly. And this just tells you whether or not for this thing the slope's going up or down. The chart that I use for just this indicator has a bunch of things on it. Uh, fast hole move, and you can see this thing go by. Again, this is a one minute chart is this very fine line burst. It's a fairly common interpretation, although people who do that don't use a whole moving average. So some of you is these yellow dots. And there's a couple of things that are interesting here. Patterns. It goes like this, and then there'll be a gap. And then it kind of wiggles around through here, and then it drops like a stone as you run their line. Some of this is of interest because what happens to the standard core 500 is that there are only 500 issues. And when things are jammed up in the 480s or the numbers are relatively close to each other, you tend to get more stratification. Um, here you'll see where the numbers are of interest because they're off the moving average. background is the distance from the actual data to the, this is yet one more eyeball chart where you can tell which way this thing is actually going to move. If you pay attention to people who tell you when they correspond to these gaps, which gives you a clue that somebody's paying attention to what these numbers are. An additional moving average crossover. And what he does is um, he uses that to help establish his bias or his posture. And I owe my thanks for showing me this thing. We trade charts sometimes during the course of the day. The common use of this thing is as a signal. If the data is positive, you're long, else if the data is negative, you're short. What you see up here is that this is a reasonably, what you would have be a very positive indicator. Here they're negative, and so this is just bad. You get, turns out to be greater than zero. You should be long in theory, otherwise you should be short. Um, the problem with that is that whatever you're looking at for the value of this indicator, it's already been priced in. And so, yeah, while the indicator can show you that you've already had a very bad day, the price won't keep changing unless the indicator changes. The indicator's got to go up or down in order for price to move away from that part, whether it's good or bad. Um, with moving averages, if the data goes above the moving average, you should be long, otherwise you should be short. That's a worthwhile thing to do, provided that you get a fast enough moving average on a slow enough chart so that you get some gap between the two. And generally, I don't particularly, there's just too much going on. I look for these big gaps, close high and the close low, which is where it is that this oscillator originally came from, this number here that I cut off. And for a given velocity, for a given length of moving average, this number tells you whether or not it's a big move or a small move. Uh, this indicator is useless on trend days because it goes up or down all day, depending upon the direction of the trend. It wiggles a little bit, but not a lot. On September the 24th, the day that I remember, just because it's the day that I remember, it was a trend up day period. And looking at this was watching a diagonal line go from the lower left of the screen to the upper right of the screen all day long with very little wiggle. Um, the indicator seems to work best on, on fear days or what I think of as non-robot days. Declining days, uh, big rotational days where the rotation is not just a point, but more like three or four days, and you get those cycles. Uh, but not ramps or fine chop. 
um, one of the things that I did once upon a time was compare the results of the strategy to whether or not prices were going up or down. And it worked better when it goes down. And my rationalization for it was that market thrust is a measure of sorts of um, enthusiasm, as it were, fear or joy over the market. And when people are scared, they tend to do things that are different than when robots are simply ramping this thing by an algorithm. And so it fit better on days that I thought felt normal, and it fit less well on days that I thought were robot-like. Another problem with this, as well as with TIP, is that the data only exists during real-time hours or uh, regular market hours. And so what happens is that how you start this thing up gets to be an interesting problem. When you do a moving average, simple 10-bar moving average, you need 10 points before you actually have value. Well, what do you do for the first nine minutes? When you deal with things like the 930 open and the New York Stock Exchange, a lot of fun things happen there. And so you can either wait for the 10 minutes to go by if you only use 10 bars, or you can figure out something else to do. And the other thing that I do is I tend to change the length of the moving average depending upon how many bars away from the open you are. For example, if I'm going to use an 18-bar moving average and you're in the third bar, I'll use a three-bar moving average and see how it is that the thing tends to fit. It works out reasonably well, uh, at least for my eyes. 